All right, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Depending on where you're you're watching from, it looks like we've got some folks from over in London, which is amazing, and all over the country. So thank you for being here. My name is Juliana Willems. We are obviously talking about small dogs today. And uh, but first, before we jump in, I just want to give a big thank you to Your Dog's Friend, who is the organization hosting this. Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit here in the D.C. area. They do incredible work. They spread incredible information about training, relationship with your dog, helping your newly adopted dog, puppies, anything you can think of. So thank you to Your Dog's Friend for hosting this and um, check out their website, yourdogsfriend.org. Please check out their YouTube channel. This presentation is going to be presented or is going to be recorded and saved on their YouTube channel. So make sure you like, subscribe, share, and uh, follow them on social media. So thank you again, Your Dog's Friend. Okay, so uh, as I said, my name is Juliana Willems. I run a training company here in the DC area, JW Dog Training and Behavior. I um, love helping your dog's friends with these workshops and these webinars. It's been amazing in the age of COVID getting to reach so many of you more than we ever could have in person. And um, we do, I do all private training for the most part, although I do a lot of work digitally as well. So on social media, podcasts, presentations like this, <clears throat> I just really love getting good information out to dog owners. And today is a topic that is near and dear to my heart because that little one that you see there on my lap in that picture is my Lola. She is my Chihuahua. So small dogs are really something that I care deeply, deeply about in the training space. And hopefully you will not hear Lola today, but you might. <laughs> okay, so like I said, I care deeply for small dogs because of my dog Lola. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Lola to kind of tell you where I'm coming from with my personal experience, um, because I think a lot of you hopefully can relate to kind of our journey, and I'm going to use her a lot in this presentation. So Lola is about nine years old, and she is actually from a backyard breeder. My fiance got her uh, before she knew any better. She now works in animal welfare. But, you know, unfortunately, when people don't know any better, they look at, you know, Craigslist or internet ads and they get dogs. And so Lola came from not a great breeding background um, and not a great socialization upbringing. So she was really at a disadvantage from the start. And Lola has been diagnosed by a veterinary behaviorist with anxiety and fear-based aggression to kind of sum summarize and simplify her diagnoses. She's, um, to label it, can be very anxious, um, fearful, and we've really gone down the road mostly in the last year, year and a half, where we really wanted to tackle her behavior issues because they kind of slowly crept up over time as she got older and we lost our other chihuahua. And we started to realize Lola was really struggling. And so we have done a lot of work with her behavior. She's doing much better now. And so I have a lot of experience about help both experiencing the challenges of those small dog behaviors and then also helping them, what has worked for us. So I'm going to tap into my experience with Lola a lot. And, but I'm, going to try not to do all of the like my dog and and my Lola because there are so many other experiences out there but her my work with her is really helpful in my knowledge about small dogs and speaking of my own dog questions sorry that I didn't mention this before I absolutely love when you guys ask questions about the content I think that's so important to make sure you get clarification about what we're um what you are hearing from me. So I absolutely ask that you put questions in the chat. And if you click on the chat button, there's an option to click Q&A. So if you can put your questions in the Q&A area, that's going to make it easier for me to see them and to answer them. And if you can ask general questions about the content, general questions about small dogs, that'd be fantastic. We unfortunately do not have time to answer specific my dog questions. So unfortunately about your specific dog, maybe a behavior issue they're having or something like that. So um, please ask general questions, questions about the content, questions about general small dogs in the Q&A, and I would love to answer those. All right, so 
my experience with small dogs. So obviously I've got my little Lola, but that is a study of one. And so I, it was really interesting when I sat down to make this presentation, because obviously I love this topic, but I really realized that um, I do have quite a wide range of experiences with small dogs. Now, I do all private training now, but prior to being full-time private trainer, I worked in a shelter. So I have a lot of experience with small dogs in shelters, which is obviously not a great easy place for them to be. A lot of them showing a lot of stress behaviors. That's me bottom left with a little chihuahua on my lap um, at the behavior desk at the DC animal shelter where I used to work. The rest of these are all my clients. I am lucky to probably have met with hundreds of small dog clients over the years. So what's really important when looking at professionals or people who you want to get information from experience alone is not enough but the thing about uh, my credentials and and where i come from as a trainer in terms of education is the science the learn the behavior learning the training the aggression and all that stuff it's all the same across the board with with all dogs big dogs little dogs but where the experience comes in is how to help small dogs and how to apply it with them. So how, yes, we know that obviously positive reinforcement training is important, but what are the mechanics? How are the mechanics going to be different with small dogs? Um, or yes, we know that the reactivity is likely fear based. So and we have to help them feel better. So how can we help small dogs? How can we apply what we know works with small dogs? So that's where kind of my education and my experience meet and really make, I just have a, a, a lot of to pull from when it comes to helping small dogs and more importantly, helping the people with the small dogs. So I'm thrilled to be here talking about this today. So what is a small dog? What, you know, anytime we use a label or go over a topic, we have to define it. What are we talking about now? A lot of my topics or my my speaking today is going to talk more about kind of the toy breeds, the small um, to generalize like the little shaky ones that are just a little they're small and they're fragile. Um, so a lot of the toy breeds and obviously whether it's a purebred or a mixed breed, I mean, so much of this stuff is going to apply. But the toy breeds are really interesting because they all have hundreds and hundreds of years of breeding to make them what they are today. But in addition to the toy breeds, obviously, there are a lot of other small dogs out there that are outside of the toy breed category. So the Internet, which is obviously <laughs> hit or miss on good, good information out there. Uh, the internet was saying uh, the number 21 and 22 pounds is kind of the general consensus of anything under that is what is considered a small dog. So the category is broad and the obviously everything that I say in this presentation is not going to apply to every single small dog out there. And it is, you know, there are going to be exceptions to what I say. These are overarching generalizations to try to help the most number of people possible but if your dog doesn't fit the descriptions that i'm talking about then don't be too alarmed right because there's just so much variability even within this even within this um group that we're categorizing today and what's also interesting is in addition to kind of the toy breeds or the other small breeds like the small terriers or the small sight hounds the um is that we're now getting these designer dogs like the toy poodles mixed with bigger dogs so there are going to be some mini golden doodles that fit this category there are going to be um, like the cavachon the shishan all those mixes that are also going to start falling under the small dog category so the list is very long so i'm going to start before we get into all the facts and truths about small dog small dogs is i'm going to first address some myths about them because this is i truly hope when you guys are finished with this presentation that you have kind of a one of more of appreciation for their behavior more of an understanding why they act the way that they do and i hope that you're ready to go maybe next time somebody laughs at a small dog barking at them maybe you're ready to kind of 
stick up for that dog and and know that what you're seeing isn't quite as funny as people tend to think. So the Napoleon complex is something you hear thrown around as a joke a lot with small dogs. Oh, they're so small. So they're making up for their size with big and bad behavior. You know, they're, they're trying to be, um, you know, big and mean because they're so small. And that is absolutely not the case. They behavior happens for a reason. We're going to talk all about it. It's typically due to fear is often the case. Um, and so to just label it that these dogs are just being mean and big and bad to make up for their size is really unfair and obviously not true. And that brings us to the next point that reactivity or aggression from small dogs is funny. And again, unfortunately, because of their size, these poor guys, nobody takes them seriously. And that is really, really damaging to the individual dog because all of that communication to get space and say, please don't do that goes ignored, which is a big bummer and can obviously be detrimental for the dog. <clears throat> and then also some people think that just because they're small, they automatically make good apartment dogs. And of course their size lends them to being, you know, they fit into apartments better, but that, that doesn't automatically mean that they will be easy to live with in apartments. In fact, their noise sensitivity for some of the breeds and their tendency to, um, yeah, just bark at, you know, maybe noises or people in the hallway, stuff like that, and their need for exercise that people might not realize. Um, of course, they can do great in apartments, but they're just not automatically going to be apartment dogs. So when in doing my research for this, I came across a website that unfortunately summed up everything that is wrong with kind of the way that we view small dogs. So I'm going to read this for you real quick. I promise I'm not going to read from my slides, but I'm just going to like moving forward, but I'm just going to read this for you real fast because it's so, it just embodies everything that is wrong with our relationship and mentality about small dogs. And this, unfortunately, I think came from a veterinarian website, which is really disappointing. A hefty percentage of phone calls to dog trainers and behaviorists are for help from anxious owners of small dogs that display small dog syndrome. This syndrome, which is also which also is amusingly referred to as the Napoleon complex, occurs when your dog thinks he's the boss. Even though you may need a magnifying glass to see the dog, they be, have become the absolute and unchallenged sovereigns of their empire thanks to you. The dilemma is most dogs don't want to be the boss. They'll, they only do it because they sense you don't possess the leadership skills required for their pack to survive. Giving this responsibility to your dog can raise their anxiety and intensify their level of stress. The Napoleon complex does not make for a well-adjusted, secure, and more, more, most importantly, happy dog. Okay, eh, wrong. All of this is completely false. The good news is we have totally debunked the dominance myth, our need to be a pack leader. Um, our dogs are not acting out of spite. They are not acting out of wanting to be the boss. There are a lot of reasons for reactive and aggressive behaviors, and none of them include wanting to be the boss. So uh, I just wanted to share this to <clears throat> say, one, don't believe everything you read on the internet. I mean, that goes without saying, especially when it comes to dog training, but two, this is just such a really sad outlook and it it completely eliminates our ability and desire to actually see what's going on with the dog. When we labels, label our dogs as stubborn or trying to be the boss or trying to dominate us, that completely inhibits our ability to really see what's going on. So just please, please, please do not listen to anyone when they say this and um, really, you know, continue to watch your dog's friend webinars because you'll learn all about body language and reactivity and um, fear and how to build confidence and what a happy adjusted dog looks like. And that's the best thing that you can do. So we're going to dive all in more into that today. So, okay, those were the myths. What does make small dogs different? Now, Society's view of them is obviously a huge change from, or hu very different from the way that we view large, medium or large, bigger dogs. And I think this is really important to note because if we ignore the fact that society thinks that small dogs are just purse dogs, they exist to be an accessory, they are only lap dogs, then 
we are totally kind of um, undermining one, their, their life as a, a dog, just as a dog, right? Not as a stuffed animal, not as an accessory, but as a dog. Um, and we, we are also using this kind of idea that society has about small dogs and, and using that as a reason to treat them a certain way. So I think it's really important to make sure that we realize society really looks at small dogs differently than we do big dogs and medium dogs. And because of this, unfortunately, small dogs are susceptible to puppy mills and really poor breeding practices. So of course, big dogs are can be part of puppy mills as well. I mean, there's, there's no question that any breed and all dogs are part of puppy mill rings, but I think the demand for having small dogs as accessories and for seeking out those cute puppy-like features, the big eyes, the small head, the, um, smaller and smaller size. Unfortunately, when you start really looking for physical traits like that, then other stuff can go out the window, which we're going to talk about in a second. So unfortunately, I think small dogs just really fall victim to puppy mills. And, you know, when it comes to a puppy store, yes, of course, you can keep a lab puppy in a small cage when they're in up to eight weeks, but it's much easier to keep small little Maltese in the puppy store box. So unfortunately, these guys are really fall victim to this stuff. So be very careful where you seek out your small dog. So, so I listened to Kim Brophy, who is an ethologist as well as a um, certified dog trainer. So, and an ethologist is the study of animal behavior in its natural state. And Kim Brophy mentioned when she went through all of the breed groups, and when she came to the toy breed, she mentioned that toy breeds are bred to be smaller, which means that they have a more tightly wound nervous system, which was so interesting to me to hear because of course, and it makes sense, of course, if they've got this tightly wound nervous system, they're going to be more susceptible to anxiety and reactivity. And when you look at it that way, you think, well, duh, of course, the little four pound, you know, Yorkie is going to be a little bit more nervous. So that was really interesting. And I highly recommend this is Kim Brophy's dog, uh, dog, <laughs> Kim Brophy's book about dogs. And um, it's just so fascinating to look at where genetics come into environment, come into learning history. So highly recommend this book from Kim Brophy. So another thing that is so important to remember with small dogs is the world exists above them. What this means is that people, so the way that people, primates, the way that we interact with dogs, we loom over them, we reach towards them, we make direct eye contact, and we are bending and we're always reaching, this is inherently, this can be inherently threatening and scary to a dog, even the most well-adjusted dog. And with small dogs, everything is existing above them and everything is reaching and everything is bending over and being bigger and, and coming at them. So it's just so much harder to live your life from so much lower when everything is up high and when people reach for you, that can just be so much more scary. So I used this graphic in another presentation a couple years ago, but I found it and I was like, this is what it looks like from a small dog angle to be started to be greeted by a human and I'm making direct eye contact, I'm bending over them, I'm reaching for them. And that is just inherently really, really hard. So it is I think we really have to remember that they are just at a disadvantage when it comes to experiencing the world around them. <sighs> Most importantly, and this is really one of the, I would say one of the biggest things with small dogs is they are less likely to have choice in their interactions. What this means is choice and control are critical for a being's welfare and emotional well-being. Think about all the choices we get to have in a day to day. We get to choose where we eat, what we eat, what we wear, what route we take to go to work, where we work. There are so many choices we get to make each day. And without those choices, our, our mental well-being would be compromised. And unfortunately, our animals do not get to make many choices. They don't usually get to choose when they go for a walk. They often, unfortunately, don't even get to choose where they walk. Um, they don't get to choose when they get their meal. There's no 
there's not a lot of choice. And especially with small dogs, where a lack of choice becomes an issue, an issue is if they're a little nervous or if they don't want to do something, they are often forced to do it because they're being held, they're picked up, they don't have enough, they're not taken seriously if they're asked, asking to get away, their body language to that says, please give me space, it goes ignored. So our small dogs, unfortunately, really can be void of choice in their day-to-day, -day, which can unfortunately really impact their emotional well-being. So we're going to talk today about ways that we can incorporate a little bit more choice, make sure that we're listening to them if they say they don't want to do something. And if they don't want to do it, how do we make it so they do want to do it? There's a lot of stuff that goes into this, but that's a big difference with small dogs is they just, they don't have a lot of choice in the world. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> we're going to dig into a little bit more small dog specific stuff. And um, we, so again, when you start breeding for things like smaller size, cuter puppy like features, you are going to compromise other parts of the dog. Meaning if you're going specifically generation after generation for a specific physical look, you are likely going to get changes in genetics when it comes to health as well. And this can be really problematic because you're not going to have as much, um, you, you're just that the health is going to be compromised a lot of the time. So some common small dog health issues. The first one is a collapsed trachea. So this is where literally the cartilage in the windpipe starts to get smaller and it makes it hard for air to go through. And this has a really distinct and um, kind of unmistakable coughing, honking sound. And while it is genetic, it can be exacerbated by pressure on a collar, over exercise, unfortunately the heat, um, being overweight. So a collapsed trachea is common. Um, it's, I think, I believe the Yorkie breeds, but also many other small dog breeds. Unfortunately, they are susceptible to the trachea. And then, um, and this is a big reason why we care a lot about equipment that we use with our small dogs. So that's why, and we're going to talk about that, but getting pressure off of their fragile little necks is critical. Small dogs are also susceptible to dental issues, which I know firsthand because probably what, four months ago now, poor Lola had to get three teeth pulled. And prior to Lola, we had Fiona, who you can see her tongue is sticking out. And that's, this is because she had absolutely no teeth left. She, she had no teeth in her mouth. So Fiona was actually a surrender to a shelter and she came in, even though she was maybe only like, I think maybe eight, well, we had no idea her age because we couldn't age her with her teeth. And, but her teeth were just rotting out of her head and they pulled all of them. And she lived a great life without her teeth, but it just goes to show that unfortunately small dogs really do their teeth go, um, go bad kind of much faster. I have a colleague who has, I believe I want to say toy poodles, and she is so diligent about brushing their teeth. She's so, she takes such great care of them. And she said, even though she brushes their teeth every night, the, they still had to have teeth pulled. So unfortunately the, you know, you're just really at an uphill battle with dental issues. And then, um, this last one, chondrodystrophy, so there's a short-legged gene that uh, bassets, um, dachshunds, corgis, and a couple, I think, other dogs, and of course, mixes of these dogs are going to have. And there's a mutation of that gene that causes the short legs, but also, unfortunately, a susceptib susceptibility to uh, disc disease. So another thing, unfortunately, that those little dogs start with genetically start at a disadvantage. And of course, all this stuff, it's just helpful to know so you can be proactive with your vet to see what can we do to prevent some of this stuff happening, be on the lookout for it. Let's talk really quickly about house training challenges. Again, I unfortunately know all too well about house training challenges. Um, when Lola, when my fiance Katie first brought Lola home, she, like many other small dog parents, relied on pee pads. And that continued for literally six, seven more years. Um, so the thing about pee pads is that your dog develops what's called a substrate preference, meaning they like going on 
soft surfaces like the pee pad, but what other, what else is a soft surface inside a house, a carpet? So you can really get stuck with a dog who doesn't really understand the difference between a pee pad and a carpet. Um, they obviously have super small bladders, so they are more likely to pee really quickly, get it out and be then, you know, they've got the reinforcement of feeling relieved when they're, after they go inside. And so it can be a real challenge to, to house train small dogs. Anytime you're dealing with small dog house training issues, you really need to go back to kind of puppy mentality of frequent ish, frequent breaks outside, very small space inside. So keep their world very small, restrict access to carpets, anywhere else you don't want them peeing, and a lot of rewards for going outside. But it really can be a challenge to house train small dogs and uh, just be very aware of the what you'll get stuck with if you're using pee pads. Um, if it's working for you, fantastic. It worked for us for a long time because we worked, we lived in an apartment with literally no carpet. And so of course the dogs would pick the pee pads, but um, it just know that it can really come with some challenges. Okay, other things to consider with small dogs. So stairs, if you guys have small dogs, a lot of you probably already have stairs. Now, back to kind of integrating health issues, these little guys, they're so small and surf, you know, beds or couches can be so far from the floor that it, we really want to be careful about them constantly jumping off the furniture because all that pressure on their front legs and their back is not great for them long term. So stairs are really helpful to alleviate that um, jumping off pressure. And then also obviously to help them get up if they can't make, if they can't make it. Um, you know, I would run into issues with Lola. We didn't have stairs at our couch at our last apartment and she would, you guys probably, this is familiar. She would come up, she would bark because she wanted to be let up on the couch. We'd go reach for her. She would run away because she would get kind of excited in this like, whoa, don't reach for me mode. So it was this horrible battle. So we finally would just, we just got the stairs and now she can use them. A nice opportunity for her to have choice to come up and down when she wants. Um, but stairs are really, really helpful for the car, for the couch, the bed, any other surfaces where we want them safely getting up and down. Just use, you know, if they need to help figuring out how to use them, use some treats, get them up, down, nice and comfortable using those stairs. Now equipment. So like I mentioned with the collapsed trachea, we really want to be careful with any type of equipment around these guys' necks. There's, you know, their necks are just so fragile. It is not worth it. Get that pressure off and get a harness. So for these guys, we're lucky that we've got a decent amount of harness options. You know, even the extra small, depending on how big your small, big or small your dog is, you might, you know, have to go through a couple different brands to find one that's small enough. Um, some people have sought out cat harnesses for their small dog. I think Fiona, my other, the little one with no teeth, I think she was in a cat harness because she was only like three pounds. And so you really have to find something that is very safe. I like this mesh harness because it it, it um, distributes the pressure really nicely. It looks very comfortable. It doesn't look like it's going to rub anywhere. And so this is a really good option for this little guy. You also want to make sure it's very secure so they can't back out of it because a lot of these little guys, they might be flight risks if they get out of anything, so be really careful. Same thing with collars. The average collar is gonna to be too heavy for our small dogs. So getting the nice thin ones that are really light around their neck is really helpful. With Lola, we have a collar where our her name and our phone number is um, embroidered on it so that we that's one tag we don't have to have her carrying around her neck because all those tags, rabies, microchip, name, it gets really heavy around our little dogs. Leashes, same thing. The average leash, leash thickness might be a little too long. So, I mean, too thick, it, too heavy. So you want to make sure you're looking for the, the thin ones that aren't going to feel like a lot of weight either on their harness um, or attach their collar. I'm going to check real fast to see if we've got any questions. Okay. We had a question about the honking sound after they drink water, but no other time. Um, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but that's a question for your vet. So I would probably try to get video of it. Any 
health concerns with your with your small dog, of course, the most helpful thing is to get a video of it and send it to your vet because um, they'll be able to tell you if there's, you know, it sounds like maybe something's being irritated by the the water and see if um, if they're concerned about it. Thank you for asking that question. Okay. So another small dog consideration, riding in cars. So Dogs Ride Certified reached out and mentioned that they've got options for little dogs, which was perfect timing because keeping your little dog safe in the car is so important. And I think with little dogs, we're more tempted to just hold them in our lap because especially if they're calm and they're not getting into trouble, then we think, oh, they can just, you know, sit in our lap while we drive, which is obviously super dangerous if anything were to happen, even if you brake quickly, you know, let alone get into a car accident. So I highly recommend this uh, website. I checked it out. They've got great information about safety in the car. Um, if you look to, I believe the right of your screen, there's a files tab and you can actually download this uh, handout. And so you have it so you know where to go find the information about options for being the car. So for other small, other small dog considerations, body temperature. So these guys often don't have a ton of fat on their body and they're so little that they get cold really quickly. So wearing jackets is going to be really important for them kind of regardless of their hair length. Again, you might have to trial and error looking for a good brand that fits your dog nicely. Lola has a large wardrobe. Okay, grooming. So all these dogs have to get groomed. Now, obviously bigger dogs have to get groomed too. But the thing about small dogs is we are so much more likely to, if they struggle or if they try to tell us I'm uncomfortable, we are so much more likely to overpower them and just say, deal with it. And this is just really stripping them of the ability to express when they're uncomfortable. This can lead to aggression. This can lead to breaking down our relationship with them. So we really want to avoid that. So on the left here, I've got some resources for you to look into more options to help your dog feel comfortable with grooming. Um, this is a video of my friend Christy, who is working with her dog, Sully, this little fluffy girl here. And we, she is working to help Sully feel comfortable with the clippers. And you'll see Sully's response to them. This is just the step one. But if you start this way, pair the clippers with food, pair the clippers with food. This is a great way for your dog to say, okay, I see those clippers and I know what they're going to predict. And I not only do I not mind them, but I actually really like them. So go ahead and watch. Uh, watch how this goes. I'm going to make sure my volume's all the way up. So Sully knew exactly what that, what those clippers predicted. She was eating her food and she came towards them. She started wagging her tail. So her mom has done a great job of saying clippers predict food. This is one way that we can really help our small dogs feel comfortable with grooming. Now, of course, it would go it would be steps from there. This is just the beginning, but how many of you, you pull out the nail trimmers or you pull out the, um, uh, you know, hair brush or something and your dog goes running right a away because they know what it predicts and they don't like it. And versus this where the dog came closer because she said, yeah, I like that. So this, it's so helpful to help our little dogs feel more comfortable with this stuff that they, you know, of course they need grooming. That's for their own safety, preventing mats, stuff like that. But we can make it a good experience for them. So speaking of making grooming positive, now this is a video of me and Lola. So I am not grooming her here, but I'm taking off her jacket. But this is another option for grooming where this blue item up at the front of the screen here is called a licky mat. And what I've done is I've taken this licky mat and I've smeared some cream cheese on it. Lola loves cream cheese and she does not like her jacket being put on and off. Lola's has been diagnosed in addition to all those other things with what's called conflict aggression, meaning if I do handling, nail trimming, stuff like that, she really doesn't like that. And so it's always a work in progress. So she doesn't like me having to, this is her heavy coat. It involves putting all of her paws in and out. So I make the, the situation 
much less stressful by adding food to the equation and letting her just focus on that while I take her coat off and she doesn't even realize that the coat is coming off. She's totally fine. So you can watch this as it happens. <clears throat> to the sweet sounds of taylor swift and so again that is not grooming but just replace that with me having to wipe her down or me brushing her if she had longer hair she was totally unfazed you also heard me say clip and over those are her two cues clip means i'm unclipping the harness which can be a little unsettling for her because it startles her and over means i'm pulling it over your head so by giving her a predictable cue that this is happening it can also make life much less stressful for her dogs really thrive on predictability and routine and so when lola knows what's going to happen when i say clip and when i say over that is really really helpful to her so as you can see she was totally fine with that scenario a really helpful option for you guys okay let's talk about picking up small dogs one of my most Ugh, it's, I have so many thoughts about picking up small dogs. And this goes back to, I mean, we have so much, again, like societal baggage with our feeling of small dogs and their, their need to just be held and put in purses and carried around. And they have four paws for a reason. And so somebody told me something once that really stuck with me when it came to picking up small dogs. They said, when a small dog is picked up, it is the equivalent of a human being scooped up, plucked off the ground, and pulled up six stories. So by, and that really, I'm looking at, you know, the top of my apartment building and just imagining being just picked up and, and just thrown in the air and maybe not even knowing it was going to happen. And, and that really helped me empathize with small dogs that we just pick them up, pick them up, pick them up, pick them up. And their size relative to how high we're picking them up, it's a really long distance. And that's the same thing as if we were just picked up multiple stories into the air. So that really helped me, again, empathize with small dogs. And, and it helps me resist pick up Lola, picking up Lola when I, I might want to, because I'm like, okay, whoa, 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 like, do I need to have her do this right now? So that being said, is there a way to give their dog give our dogs choice when being picked up and to make it a positive experience so resist the urge to always pick them up really and i promise you this is hard i've had to really reprogram my brain ever since i really ever since i heard that story like the multiple stories humans being picked up multiple stories um analogy i was i've just really tried to be different about the way i view picking up lola and it's actually an interesting kind of We'll say conversation maybe maybe not argument uh that me and my fiance get into because if lola is sniffing for too long or if she's taking her time or she doesn't want to do something you know katie is quick to want to just scoop her up and, and say like let's go we're in a rush and i'm like no we have to let her walk because her paws being on the ground gives us data how is she feeling does she want to come in this direction is she feeling okay why is she freezing is she looking around is she nervous about something and to just strip her of that ability to communicate and that ability to, to maybe you know small dogs need to sniff too which we're going to talk about and if she's taking her time how can we help her move forward where it's her idea instead of us always just making the choice for her nope you're taking too long swoop picking her up so I know it's impossible to not pick up small dogs. And I'm not saying, I mean, you saw the picture of me and Lola before where we were on the beach and I'm picking her up and holding her. So I'm not saying you never can pick up your small dog. I just really ask that you reconsider, you always stop and ask yourself, do I need to pick my dog up right now? And in a perfect world, our dogs would be, we would have a, a conversation with our dog. We would say, hey, are you ready to, for me to pick you up? And they would say, sure let's go let's do it i know what being picked up means i know what it predicts i feel comfortable with it right now yes i want to be picked up 
that would be best case scenario is adding some consent to that equation. So is there any way you can give your dog a way to tell you they are ready to be picked up? Can you kneel down and pat your leg they, and they put their paws up and they know that means you're gonna pick them up? Can you get them to get into position so that you can easily pick them up? Or is there a way to give them choice in that interaction? I really urge you to think about that. And even if you can't get to the point where you're you're able to, and actually that's interesting. If you if you say, hey, are you opting into to getting picked up? That means you're leaving the conversation open for them to opt out. And I would really urge yourself to bend down, go to pick them up and see what happens. Do they run away? Because they know that they can in that moment. It's not happening fast enough for them to have no choice. Are they resisting? Are they wiggling out of your hand? How do they act when you slowly go to pick them up where they have time to react in a way that reflects how they feel about what about to, about what is about to happen? So adding a verbal cue to being picked up can be very helpful. Exactly like with Lola taking her harness off, I said clip and then I clipped. It is an indicator this thing is about to happen and it adds predictability and it takes the surprise out of the equation. So a lot of times with Lola, I'll say going up and then I'll pick her up because again, it just prevents this like, whoa, if we can say going up, she goes, okay, I know what's gonna happen here. I know what to expect and it's not as unsettling. And of course, pairing picking up with good stuff, treats, um, petting and love that they're interested in in that moment so dogs are not always interested in a lot of kissing and smooching, which I will say Lola endures a lot of. She does not love it, and I fully acknowledge that. Um, I try to refrain, but we really want to pair picking up with something our dogs actively like. So food is a big motivator for Lola. Um, and so that is what I try to always, I, I will say going up, I'll gently pick her up, and I'll go get her a treat. And that helps to make picking up less aversive for her, more predictable, and something she's more comfortable with. All right, let's jump into small dog needs, okay? So we've talked a lot about considerations you need to take with small dogs, things that you might need to think about that you wouldn't if you had a, had a big dog. So now let's talk specifically about their needs. So small dogs need exercise, enrichment, training, choice and control over their environment, which we have talked a bunch about. And most importantly, small dogs need to feel safe. And we're gonna talk a lot about how behavior challenges usually come from not feeling safe, but really that's so important. Again, given that they have genetic predispositions to be a little nervous, they the world exists above them. They don't typically get choice in interactions. How can we help them feel more safe across the board? So small dogs, well, let me back up for a second. I'm not, I didn't do a slide on exercise, but it's so critical that we do not think that our small dogs don't need exercise because maybe they're small or they're okay with sleeping during the day. It's really, really important that we get our small dogs exercise needs met. Uh, for an older dog like Lola, who really is fine sleeping most of the day, she's pretty good with like a 115 minute walk a day with lots of sniffing. She does not need a lot of physical exercise. She just gets a lot of mental exercise, but physically she's fine. But if you have a six month old Chihuahua or a six month old Pomeranian, that's a teenager. That is an adolescent dog who absolutely needs a lot of exercise, um, both physical and mental. So really, and also health wise, older dogs benefit from exercise, of course. So do not take your dog's ability to chill inside as an indicator that they don't need exercise. And also we'll talk later about barking, but I think a lot of times small dogs are extra barky because they're not getting their physical and mental exercise needs met. So really, really keep that in mind. Now we don't have to overdo it, but we certainly cannot forget their need to go for walks every day, run around, get that panting, aerobic exercise, all that is so important for them. All right, let's talk about enrichment. So enrichment is so important. Enrichment is basically a dog's options for dogs to practice and engage in natural species-specific behaviors. Sniffing, chewing, licking, playing, and training. 
These give dogs outlets for their need to dig, their need to chase, their need to destroy, all those doggy behaviors that don't typically fit in the human world unless we give intentional outlets for them. So you see this dog working on a food puzzle here. Uh, small dogs absolutely love enrichment. We're gonna go by uh, um, category by category. Now this is a book, Canine Enrichment for the Real World, that I absolutely recommend because it will give you a whole different view on enrichment. And it's so important to note that enrichment is essential. It is not an added bonus. Enrichment is absolutely necessary for our dog's mental state and well-being. And a little enrichment will go a long way in terms of decreasing barking, decreasing unwanted behaviors, um, and it, it is so critical for our dogs to have this outlet. I'm just checking questions real fast. So I'm gonna really spend time on questions at the end, guys. Um, sorry if I don't get to yours in the moment, but I'm going to see if I can glance and see one in while I'm talking, I will of course answer it, but otherwise I'm gonna spend time to do it at the end, okay? Thank you. And remember, if you can throw it in the Q&A version of the chat, that will be also helpful for me to see. All right, sniffing. Sniffing is so important for our dogs. Sniffing is a natural behavior that calms dogs. It's a natural calming um, behavior. It is so good for their brain. It tires them out. It is so important. So when you are walking your, your small dog next time, let them sniff. Sniffing is so helpful to you know, a 10 minute walk where you're just marching along and making your dog walk, if you spent that 10 minutes letting them sniff, even if you don't make it as far, you'll be surprised. They're actually gonna be much more tired after they, uh, if they, if you allow them to sniff. So sniffing doesn't always have to happen outside on your walk. Sniffing can happen inside when making your dog or letting your dog look for treats. So go ahead and watch this video. Uh, this is a super easy, So that was an Instagram reel, which you can <clears throat> find more of on uh, my Instagram page, which I'll link at the end. Okay, we had a great question about sniffing. So with sniffing, the question is, with sniffing, how do you know when it's a cue for needing to go to the bathroom? Are there ways to tell? So great question. And I would say outside, that's all the more reason to let your dog sniff because they are they might need to go to the bathroom they're trying to find a good spot so whether it's they're reading doggy emails p mails as we say or they are sniffing to find a spot to go to the bathroom all the more reason to let them sniff that spot now if it's inside obviously if you just put some treats down and they're sniffing the floor that's one thing but if they're circling the carpet uh there's nothing on the ground and they're just sniffing that's a good indicator that they might be needing to go to the bathroom. So very good question. There was another question about exercise. What or how much exercise a teddy bear dog needs? So um, I'm not sure exactly what a teddy bear dog, what that is considered, if that's uh, what breed that is, but I'm assuming that it's a small dog. And so definitely, you know, that's actually a really good question. And I don't think all small dogs are created equal in terms of exercise needs. Obviously a younger one um, is going to need more. Maybe I would say a younger dog, like a dog under a year and a half, an hour total a day. So you can split that up and do a couple uh, walks, some fetch. Um, I think, an, yeah, I think an hour a day for a younger, small dog would be great but then you know again a dog like lola who is nine and she loves to sleep most of the day she's great with like a 20 minute walk once a day if, especially if we can sprinkle in some other training so really good question oh it's a 
Shih Tzu. Okay. I, you learn something new every day. Thank you. So a Shih Tzu, same thing. I mean, I think that that's a great, uh, a, a, you know, under, so when they're still an adolescent, so for small dogs, they're teenagers about five to six months. That's when they transition out of puppy phase and into adolescence, which is a tough age in dog ownership. Um, and then they're a little crazy and they need to have a big need for exercise chewing. They're a little nuts. Um, until lucky for small dog owners, they start to mature around a year and a half versus like a lab of big dog isn't going to mature between until between two and three years old. So when your young dog, your small dog is a teenager. So again, between six months and a year and a half, they're going to really need a, quite a bit of exercise. Um, but we always want to really balance that with mental exercise. So we're not just creating an athlete, like don't just go run your dog on the treadmill. That's not at all what they need. They need that nice mix of physical and mental exercise which is why walking with a walking and sniffing is great. Okay. So enrichment, chewing and licking. So we talked about sniffing, chewing and licking is super important for small dogs. Chewing and licking is good for both small dog or young dogs who, um, they need something to do. They need that mental exercise. The It keeps them occupied in a really good and important way. And you kind of feed two birds with one seed where they get their need for chewing out and it's not on your couch and it's not on the leg of your chair. It's on something legal that they're allowed to have and it tires them out and it makes them tired afterwards. So, but this is also really helpful for older dogs no matter what age, enrichment is so important and chewing and licking is so important for dogs of all ages. And it's really helpful, especially if your dog is a little bit nervous or anxious because it helps them kind of dissipate that stress and, and really um, calms them down, letting them chew and lick. So make sure you've got safe chewing options so you can talk to your vet about what's a good choice for your dog. Um, I didn't put this in here, but you know, like the dental chews, that's a great, again, feeding two birds with one seed. You clean your dog's teeth, you get some maintenance work happening there. And then they also get to have their nice chewing for that day. So Lola, if we have a rainy day or something, I, and I can't walk her, she always gets a Kong. Um, there's always, you know, I, I might push some cheese in there. I might push a little bit of her wet dog food. It's, she always gets some licking because she doesn't seem to chew, enjoy chewing as much. She's, she's really a licking dog. And these no hide sticks over on the right. I love these, uh, for small dogs because they're really high quality. They can't, um, of course your dog can get them smaller, but I have not seen them break off pieces of them. And so as long as you give them supervised, this can be a really good little dog chew. Down on the left here, this Frenchie is licking out of a licky mat. They are in the bathtub. This is a great way. Again, I use this with Lola with the grooming coat video earlier. It's a great way to keep them in one spot licking, which decreases their stress levels and creates a positive association. So play. Play is critical for small dogs. And um, it is just, there's so many different ways to play with your dog. Lola loves uh, to chase toys back and forth across the apartment. Some dogs like to chase sticks. Some dogs like to wrestle with you. This is a sweet, sweet little um, dog named Charlie who is playing with her flirt pole. Go ahead and watch Charlie. this. Drop. Good girl, let's go. Good job, good job. Pole, which is a fantastic uh, option for small dogs. It is literally like a cat toy for dogs. You need a bit of a green space to play with it, but this can be a lot of fun, especially for your young dogs. It's called a flirt pole. You can get them on Amazon. Um, and so highly recommend this to get, again, the wiggles out for your littles. Okay. I have a note about the pedigree dental sticks that they are not good to give your dog for chewing anything food chew wise that I say today, always double check with your vet because they are the going to be the number one um, person to say yes or no for if something is good and appropriate for your dog. So play with other dogs in terms of both enrichment and does your dog enjoy it? Now, it is so important to note that not all dogs enjoy playing with other dogs. 
especially as they hit maturity, which we mentioned for small dogs is usually about a year and a half. So it's not uncommon for dogs to enjoy when they're a puppy and a teenager to like playing with other dogs, but they can very quickly grow out of that and much prefer to just spend time with their own friends. So if your dog starts to get a little bit of aggressive tendencies with dogs they don't know, or they stop enjoying time at the dog park, that is super normal and do not feel forced to get them play with other dogs. Um, again, they might enjoy playing with their doggy friends, but not with strange dogs, which is totally normal. Or your dog might just not want to play with other dogs at all. Also totally fine and totally normal. What we have to take into account with small dogs is safety when playing with other dogs. Now, depending on how big your dog is or um, how fluffy your dog is, or I should say how small or how fluffy, unfortunately, you have to be extra careful when it comes to other dogs because these little... Um, whether Chihuahua, Little Yorkie, Little Fluffy Maltese, Papillons, these dogs can look a whole lot like rabbits and other wildlife. And they can, they can really um, spark prey drive in other dogs. There is something called a predatory drift where an interaction might start as play and then it pretty quickly switches in the other dog to predation. And that is genetics. That is not something they can control, but it is something we as small dog owners have to be extremely cautious about. So I never, ever, ever recommend your big dog or your small dog playing with big dogs at a park, especially if they're unknown dogs, because that predatory drift, that predation factor, just it, it you cannot control it. It again, it's the dog, the the predator dog is not thinking. They are just acting on their instincts and it can cause death in your dog and it's just not worth it. Same thing with like doggy daycares. I typically recommend places that separate by size. Um I've run into a few that don't separate and um that they you know have their reasons for it but I, and I would really ask why they don't separate because I just don't the the risk for me is too high um you know the the error side of trial and error to see if your small dog if that big dog can play with your small dog is too too high so um I would just be very very careful about uh where you who you let your dog play with and where you let them play all right, let's talk about training our small dogs, which I'm gonna talk most about for the second half of this. So training is so important for our small dogs. And I think because of their small size, because they're easy to just drag past the other dog on leash or pick up if they're barking, unfortunately they don't get as prioritized for training as I think a lot of big dogs are where people are more concerned about safety on leash for big dogs. and you know, knocking people over if they jump, like if our little dogs jump on someone, the the risk of hurting somebody is much, much lower. So I think unfortunately our, our little dogs really miss out on a lot of great training opportunities and they thrive with training, just like all dogs and all animals, they really enjoy training, positive reinforcement training, of course. So using rewards, treats, praise, play to reinforce behavior you like, is so, so, so important with our small dogs. They are capable of learning every single thing that any other dog would learn, and they would are likely going to enjoy it, especially if we prioritize making training fun. Now, it is so important with our small dogs that we do not use techniques that are aversive, that use force, or are punishing in any way. We don't want to use spray bottles, or citronella collars, or shock collars, or prong collars, any of that stuff that causes scary, painful, uncomfortable um, consequences to their behavior is unfortunately going to really increase their fear. It could increase their anxiety. And even worse, it's going to break the bond between you two. So we really want to avoid any training techniques and especially any trainers who want to use techniques that are going to increase your dog's fear, stress, anxiety, especially knowing that a lot of these dogs are already genetically predisposed to some of these anxious and fearful conditions. So we don't want to do anything that makes it worse. We want training to focus on fun and building confidence and bonding with you as the owner and positive reinforcement training can accomplish all of that. So let's watch Miss Charlie training in Home Depot. 
This dog is so fantastic to work with. She's a little Havanese and here we are just working on her behaviors in obviously a super distracting environment. <laughs> So as you can see, little Charlie is just thriving with training. She's enjoying it. She is so good at it. And all of our dogs are capable of this. So <clears throat> well, I'm going to talk all about kind of training mechanics and what it's like to train our, do our small dogs and where you can get help training them. So let's dive into the common behavior issues that uh, a lot of you are probably here to learn about. So Barking, obviously, unfortunately, our small dogs get the, the name yappy little dogs a lot, but this barking is often from being noise sensitive, so they're nervous about noises. Um, it can be fear-based reactivity if you're finding it on leash or towards guests, and they also can display what's called demand barking. Um, other on leash reactivity, whether it's towards dogs or people or other things. And then of course, biting. So nipping, you know, they call again, the stupid name, ankle biters. Um, all of these things are classic issues that unfortunately our dogs, our small dogs can suffer from. So I'm gonna talk real quickly about demand barking. Uh, everything else, I got a lot of reactivity stuff in here, but for the demand barking specifically, I think a lot of it is our dog's needs are not being met. Most of the time, it's going to be that mental side. So physically, making sure you're giving them lots of play, but then balancing that out with a lot of mental exercise, making them work for their meals, through food puzzles, snuffle mats, um, giving them stuff to chew on, doing training with them. I think that demand barking is often from our dogs having some pent up uh, energy and um, an unmet need. And so if we can really bump up their mental exercise, especially, and really start incorporating some training and some brain activities for them each day, that's really going to help with the demand barking. And um, of course, so across the board for all this stuff, guys, if, if there's an issue with your specific situation that you are unsure about, a lot of it comes down to working with a certified trainer. I wish I could tell you that after this, this uh, presentation, you're just going to be able to solve your dog's reactivity, right? But I can't, I cannot give you enough information here to solve your issues. I'm going to talk a lot about what the training is going to look like and how it might work, but the, the nitty gritty is going to be either a full reactivity webinar from your dog's friend, a reactivity group class, private training. There's a lot of a uh, lot more information that you need than this quick two hour webinar where I'm covering so many, such a wide range of topics. Okay, so barking inside. Now whether, most of the time this is gonna be, again, what we label as noise sensitivity. Your dog hears people in the hallway, they see people out the window, that's more visual. Um, your small dogs can be very, very barky inside. And of course there are training techniques to decrease this, but what I, highly recommend for people is management, meaning you're changing the environment in a way that decreases the opportunity your dog has for um, seeing, this bar seeing the triggers, barking at them, and rehearsing the behavior. So we, I highly recommend window film to block a visual. It's going to look like this. So we are at a big advantage because our small dogs we don't have to block as much of our window. You can see here, this window right behind Lola here. So you can see the bottom half is, um, it has that window foam on it. So she, Lola has gotten much better with her barking inside, but if she sees somebody in the courtyard, she's still gonna bark at them. Window film really, it, like it has decreased her barking by 90%. She used to bark every single evening, every day, 
and she barely barks now unless she's sitting all the way at the top of the couch sunning herself and she sees somebody. So this has been a huge life changer for us. I highly recommend window film outside windows that your dog is barking at. So white noise machine or radio and TV to block out um, sounds. So this is where if you have, if you're living in an apartment or if your dog doesn't like hearing um, something outside, white noise machines can be really helpful for this. And then also if your dog barks at guests, you manage the, the situation by just putting them in a crate or in a separate room. When your guests are over, you're just avoiding the issue. Now this is not training. I have not trained Lola to not bark at stuff she sees outside. I've just eliminated the issue. That works much better for me. I've done a whole webinar with your dog's friend about management. I absolutely love management as somebody who trains other people's dogs all day long. Uh, when I come home, I have a hard time finding time to train Lola and I like working on more like tricks with her. So, um, I, I much, much, much prefer management. So one other piece to management that I use with Lola is, so this is a setup. You can see she's got her purple leash is attached to her harness in a bed. Now, when I'm on my calls, whether it's a virtual call or a webinar or like a training lesson, anything like that, when I first moved, Lola would still be noise sensitive. She'd be sitting on the bed and barking. And because she'd be hearing noises, she wasn't quite settled in our new apartment. So what I did is I tethered her to my chair and I gave her a Kong, which you saw a couple of slides ago in the enrichment piece. And she just sleeps there and she's relaxed. And now when I'm on my calls, she's now conditioned. Oh, this is our chill time. So she's like um, right here on the bed right now, totally asleep. And that you know, a lot of dogs, whether they're big or small, got into the habit of barking when they see their humans talk at the screen, right? Because we're really animated. And so tethering with something to do and to help them settle, tethering to you so that you can maybe put a hand down to help them settle, pet them or something like that to help them calm down. That can really, really, really decrease their barkiness while you're on calls. It really changed everything for Lola. So she doesn't have to be tethered anymore. She, um, again, is conditioned to be very calm during uh, when I'm on my calls. So it is so critical that we give our littles a safe space. So dogs have three options when they're scared. We've got fight, flight, or freeze. Now freezing, unfortunately for small dogs, a lot of people mistake as, um, uh, calm, right? And they are not, they're not comfortable when they're frozen. Just because your small dog is not doing anything does not mean that they're comfortable. This comes down to reading body language, which we'll talk about later. Then we've got flight, which is removing themselves, running away, being scared. And then we've got um, fight, unfortunately, which is what we see a lot with our small dogs, obviously advancing, barking, reacting, aggressing. And they don't always pick the same choice each time. Some dogs will pick flight until they feel too scared and they fight. Some dogs will freeze and then fight. So it all is very fluid. But one thing we can do to help our small dogs if they are reactive in any way is to give them a safe space. So I had a little Chihuahua client named Daisy and Daisy was extremely fearful to label her. She showed major fear and stress behaviors when she was uncomfortable, her mom was her whole world and they lived in their apartment and, and Daisy liked it that way. And she was much more, she was very comfortable and it was just her owner, but anytime anybody else would come in, Daisy would bark and be very scared. And so unfortunately Daisy's owner, well, not unfortunately, as, uh, as people do, Daisy's owner wanted to introduce Daisy to a friend that she wanted to be able to have over. And Daisy would be so scared. So she would hide under the couch that, that, um, flight, right? But then when the guest would walk by, Daisy would get so scared that she would dart out and bite him and then run back to her safe space under the couch. So she was obviously extremely terrified and she would uh, try to get the community, she would try to communicate, I don't like you being here. You scare me. Please get away from me. You're too close. And then go back to her safe space. So 
we liked that Daisy was choosing to hide most of the time, but we obviously didn't like that she was choosing to hide in a place where she could still run out and bite. So what we did is we got Daisy this, a little pen type thing like this one on the right here. She didn't need quite as small space as a crate. We wanted this to be very comfortable for her, for her have a bed in there, some water. And then we went ahead and covered it. It was very close, small and comfortable. And um, we zipped it shut and she, that was her space where she could not practice running out and uh, getting that the person. And safe spaces are kind of a home base where our dogs can take a break from whatever is scaring them. Well, whether we kind of put them there and close the gate in, and remove them from being having to be exposed to the scary thing. Lola goes in her crate when we've got workmen over. We just, so she can't practice running towards them and barking at them because like I said, she gets very scared. Um, and or whether they choose to go there on their own, it's really, really critical that our little dogs have a safe space to go where they feel safe. So we talked all at the beginning that human interactions with, with small dogs are can be threatening and can be scary. So meaning reaching towards them, looking at them, making direct eye contact, all of this stuff can be very scary and uncomfortable to them. And so what is the right way to interact with littles? If they are, if they might be a little bit nervous or you're unsure if they're going to be comfortable with you. So I definitely recommend you kneel down to their level so that you're not reaching and looming over them and staring at them. You're going to face your shoulders away and let them come to you if they want to, because you're not going to them. We are certainly not reaching. We're gonna avoid eye contact. We're not doing anything that initiates contact and we most definitely are not gonna corner them. So what this looks like is this, pretend like this is a small dog. This was for my fearful dog presentation a couple years ago. So you can see my shoulders are not facing directly towards this dog. Um, I'm looking away, I'm kneeling down, I'm trying to make myself as not threatening as possible. So if you're wondering if a small dog is interested in being your friend, this is the best way to see if they want to interact with you. Uh, so really quickly, we're gonna back up and talk a little for a second about um, a safe space. So there is a question, my little won't go into a crate or a pen. She's like Velcro and must be on or next to me at all times. How can I encourage her to have her own space? This is a fantastic question. So this does come down to some separation training and definitely something, especially if your dog can be a little bit reactive, it's something that you have to prioritize to give them this option of safety and feeling secure when they're not with you. So it's really important you start slow, very short increments of time, try to pair them being in there with something really good and tasty that they like. Um, if you need to first be standing next to the pen and slowly move away over time, uh, there's a lot that goes into helping your dog feel comfortable when they're by themselves. And um, one option for this is working with a certified separation anxiety trainer, CSAT. These folks are fantastic at dealing specifically with, with separation phobias. And it kind of depends on if a dog is just having separation distress or if they are truly experiencing separation anxiety, but we cannot have panic. I mean, if our dogs are panicking in the small space, that defeats the purpose. So we really want to consider um, how we can help them feel more comfortable. So really great, great question, um, Christina, thank you. Okay, so let's talk quickly, or not quickly, this is not gonna be quick, but let's talk about unleashed reactivity. So the reactivity is any big reaction to a stimuli, overreaction to a stimuli. So this could be your little might be reactive to people, strangers, people wearing hats, men, um, bikes, strollers, other dogs, whatever the issue is, you, we would consider that, we would label that as kind of on leash reactivity. It is typically rooted in fear. Again, this behavior looks so big and bad and like they're being this big, loud, confident being, but unfortunately it is most often rooted in fear, um, not being comfortable, wanting the thing to go away. It can be addressed. It is not a lost cause just because they are small and barking does not mean we cannot help them feel more comfortable and give them better options to do. 
The most important thing with leash reactivity for our small dogs is teaching foundation behaviors. So for me, this means responding, their ability to respond to their name and giving you default attention. And so little Luna here in this picture is one of my clients. We thought she was a little senior chihuahua that her owner so wonderfully adopted recently. And um, she has extreme fear, unfortunately, which leads to very, very extreme reactivity. And um, here her owner is working on some attention. You can see Luna is looking so lovingly up at her owner. She knows that checking in with her owner is going to predict food. Again, that positive reinforcement, reinforcing behaviors that we like. We typically are going to practice this in a low distraction environment first and then take it on the road. But we're during COVID right now, everything is outside, which is why we had to be outside for this. But um, you can and should work on this stuff inside. And we actually just did, her owner just did a DNA test and it turns out that she is part dachshund. So Luna is actually not a Chihuahua. She is now uh, officially a Chihuini. So that's an exciting addition. Um, all right. So before we jump into some more reactivity work and talking about foundations, let's talk about training mechanics for small dogs, because that is a big difference when it comes to how you're going to train a big dog versus a small dog, because quite literally, their mouth is significantly further away from your hand. And timing in training is so important when it comes to getting results. If you are not seeing results, it's likely due to a mechanics issue, a timing issue, because timing is, it's just so important. And we have to really get to their mouths quickly. So you can literally see how low to the ground I am feeding Lola in this picture. And I say it as a joke, but it is so true. Be prepared to get your squats in because you have to get low to them very quickly. One thing that can be helpful for you to buy you some time between when you get the good behavior and when you reinforce it is using a marker signal. So I use a yes with Lola and because I don't always have my clicker on me, but a clicker is a great way to communicate to our dogs. Yes, that's what I wanted. Here's your food. So you can mark the moment they look at you, they check in and then deliver the food. And we don't have to worry about being quite as quick with our food delivery. And when it comes to rewards, obviously we don't, we cannot risk our dogs getting overweight. Our little dogs are going to get full much faster. So we really want to use tiny little treat options. And actually, in terms of delivering food quickly, one option is using a wooden spoon with a little bit of peanut butter or cheese on the, um, like squeeze cheese on the end. That's a really helpful way if you need to save your back or you um, can't quite get down to your, fat, your dog so quickly. Um, so these are one of my favorite brands of training treats, one of just one of many, but I like these because they're very easy to rip up. So squishy is important. So you can break into teeny tiny little pieces. Lola literally gets like just a tiny little crumb every time I reinforce her. And it's really important to, this is where kind of the experience with small dogs is so critical because you have to play around with what works best to, to maintain the quality of the training because that is so important. So this is a foundation behavior. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to talk about training concepts. I'm going to show you some training. Most of this stuff, I'm not going to step, talk you through steps about how to do this, except for this one. I am going to just show you a quick video about how we teach um, default attention, which I think is a cornerstone of improving behavior from our dogs, because we need to teach them without us asking to offer that attention that they know when in doubt, look at their human. This is so critical for improving behavior. Um, so you'll notice I am not cueing Lola in this video. This is step-by-step -step how you're going to teach um, default attention. Yes. Good. Yes! 
Okay, I'm going to end that early um, because you guys get the idea. You're capturing the moment your dog looks at you and you start inside where they are most likely to look at you. Uh, so that was where Lola offered me attention. Lola is a champ now. She is fantastic at offering, at checking in with me when I don't cue her to. And this is going to really help us down the road with other dogs because, which is really what she's reactive to is dogs, she's not as much people. Um, but she knows that looking at me always pays. I always bring treats with me on walks. And the nice thing about having a small dog is I literally only bring two teeny little pieces of treats and it lasts us typically our whole walk because she's getting such small pieces. So it doesn't have to be a big, um, it doesn't have to be a big, like grabbing your treat pouch and stuff as much with, as with big dogs, because we don't have to bring as many out. There was a great question about that last video why did I put the treats on the ground? So really good question. Um, I used to feed Lola on the ground a lot more because I found that her putting her head down kind of uh, helped her focus more on the food than on the environment. So, cause she used to be very reactive and really scan the environment a lot. And so if I would feed her down low, not only would she take a second ignoring the environment looking for the treat, but then she would reorient back up to me. I don't do that anymore, which I didn't even kind of think about that until you brought that up. I feed her to her mouth now because she's not scanning as much. And so I just give her the treat right away. Uh, but I think dropping the treat on the ground can just, again, be kind of a nice way to break any type of hyper focus in the environment. Great question. Thank you. So this is Lola playing the name game, meaning she's just responding to her name. So in addition to default attention outside, I think it's extremely important that our dogs can respond to their name outside or another what's called positive interrupter, which is another fun sound, bop, 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 something like that. Um, <clears throat> Lola's ears just went up because she knows that's usually important. Uh, so you can see her here, super quick video where she's just responding to her name. This is not a tutorial, it's just an exhibit, um, her showing how she responds to her name outside. Yes. Yes. The yes happens as soon as she looks at me. Uh, yes, good. Good job. So again, she's gotten really, really good at that. And um, now, so now I kind of have a few layers of getting her attention. One, she offers it most of the time, but if she's not offering it, then she will uh, I have the option of saying her name and she's pretty responsive to that. Now we have a very strong reinforcement history of her responding to her name and, uh, which is why she's so good at it. So remember behavior that gets reinforced gets repeated. So now we're going to talk about actually training for reactivity. So we are with reactivity. We are aiming to do two things. One, address the underlying issue for the fear that is driving the reactive behavior. I don't like seeing you, you scare me, I wanna make you go away. If we can say, oh, you're not so bad, I actually don't mind if you go away, or I mean, if you're here, or if you leave, go, whatever. If we can address that underlying issue, our dog's behavior is gonna improve significantly. So the first step to that is rewarding our dogs for calmly looking at triggers. Now, this little guy is, um, so, so, so wonderful. And he is working on, he lives unfortunately in a very busy city environment, but his owner's doing a fantastic job helping him feel more comfortable with seeing dogs specifically. So I'm keeping the volume off on this one because, um, there's just like a lot of chatter and I'm talking and it's distracting. So what you're going to look for are the moments that his ears kind of perk forward and he sees a trigger. 
And then you're going to see his owner re reward him for looking and not reacting, for looking calmly. So I will kind of narrate a little bit and uh, you can see this first step with reactivity where we're just rewarding calm looking. A lot of times people want to get their dog's attention away from the trigger and you're kind of nagging and you're like, look at me, look at me, look at me. But what that does is it the dog then doesn't learn how to see the trigger and be calm. So their first step in reactivity training, we just want them to see the bit, see the trigger and be calm. This is where trying to teach you guys about reactivity in a short presentation with a ton of other topics is hard because there are a lot of pieces to this that are going to be missing that you might wonder, well, how does this work? You know, well, my dog doesn't do this or whatever. And so I apologize if that there are going to be missing holes here. One piece that is so critical with training for reactive behaviors on leash is um, doing it where your dog is under threshold. So at a distance far enough away from the trigger where they can see it and not explode. We are working across the street here. Uh, this dog would do pretty well with dogs across the street. Anything closer was too hard, but he was pretty good at um, seeing dogs across the street. So there's not a trigger there, even though his ears went up. So right there, he's seeing one and she's getting that treat right to his mouth. There he's seeing one again. He's seeing one not here. So anytime his ears are kind of to the side, she's just reinforcing him for being good. So now he sees it and he's looking back at her. He's doing great. Yep, he sees it there. So again, you see those ears are perked. Now we really liked that he disengaged on his own. He was not too fixated. So now he's able to see the trigger and look back at mom, which is ultimately what we're looking for, but he's doing great seeing the trigger calmly and looking for food. This is like A plus training, really, really, really good. She was using a marker to reward him for um, noticing the trigger and staying calm. So that was an example of the total first step with reactivity because again we're trying to teach our dogs the scary thing predicts good stuff for you the scary thing predicts good stuff so we're addressing that underlying emotion saying you don't have to be scared because it predicts good things for you and we're also reinforcing wow thank you for watching calmly because your natural reaction is to bark and lunge when you see it so thank you for watching calmly now, I'm going to show you a video here of Lola learning to see a, a trigger and look back. So now we've taught a replacement behavior for the lunging. Instead of barking and lunging, look back at us. And um, she does this quite well. It's also very fluid, though. So if a dog is too threatening to her, too scary, she will um, not be able to look back. So I just reward her for looking calmly and I intervene. Uh, I'm going to make this this video uh, uh, this big because I want to make sure you can see where she is and um, see really what she's doing and when I'm marking. Warming her up a little. So now I'm waiting for her to look back at me after seeing something. There was a dog across the street. She couldn't bring her attention away. So I marked it. So a uh, good question. How do I intervene? So if Lola is having a hard time with a dog, meaning, so with her, I know she's having a hard time because I read her body language. I see her staring. I see her tail go up. I see her hackles go up. That's telling me she is about to react and she's having a really hard time. Um, and so I will just start feeding her because I need her emotional state to go from, wow, there's a threat to, oh, okay, I'm eating treats. I'm feeling better. So I'll feed. Um, I might, there are a lot of things you can do with reactivity. You might do a U-turn. You might body block so they don't have the visual. You might do a treat scatter to get their attention away from the trigger. There are a lot of really good options. Um, Your Dog's Friends has some amazing reactivity webinars that I highly recommend you check out to get a more in-depth uh, kind of 
lesson on how to deal with reactivity, but you know, we, we're not wanting our small dogs to flounder here. We don't want them to um, just start reacting if we can't catch them in time. It's, we really, really need to make sure that we're helping them out. And if they're feeling scared, reacting, anything like that. A really good question. What if outside they could care less about a treat because they're so distracted or interested in what's going on? So this is a very good point. You often have to bring super high value treats with you outside, especially if you're dealing with any type of reactive behavior. Our dogs are not going to work for the same stuff that they work for inside. Um, you that's where like a couple slides back those really squishy steak treats can usually high value you need to up the ante enough so that your dog is okay i'm a little feeling a little threatened i'm a little nervous but i'll still eat that what you have it might be small pieces of cheese ham something like that but um it is really critical that you bring something outside that they're willing to work for it that's going to be much better than their regular training treats Lola's gotten to the point, she's very much in maintenance mode now. She's doing great. She sees most dogs and looks back at me and that I'm just bringing her regular treats out that I'm lucky enough that she's still working for. But when we first started, I really needed to bring higher value stuff out. So great question. Okay, so now, um, okay, there was, sorry, one more question. Great question about reactivity. The question is, you mentioned to train under the dog's threshold. I live in an apartment complex and sometimes a dog and its owner come out of nowhere and my dog goes immediately into leash aggression. At that point, should I just turn around? Great question. And I'm so sorry that I have not mentioned this yet. Yes, if our dog is reacting, we are just a boarding mission. We are getting the heck out of there. We are getting them to safety as quickly as possible. Once our dog is reacting, they are not in a place for learning. They are not in a place for thinking and they cannot snap out of it if you stay where you are. There's absolutely nothing that we can do in those moments that are going to probably salvage the situation. So you just need to get distance as quickly as you can away from the trigger. Think of it as, okay, you reacted, but can I prevent you from practicing that reaction for another 20, 30 seconds by just doing a U-turn and getting out of there? So really good question and thank you. Those of us who live in apartment complexes, I mean, it's much harder for us because our opportunities for retreating or getting distance is much, much more challenging. So great question. Thank you. Oh, okay. We actually had another great question. Thank you. Amy asked, can I pick her up? So I'm so glad you asked this. And at the end of this uh, presentation, I linked to a podcast where I talked to my friend Renee about small dogs. And we had a much more in-depth conversation about picking dogs up when it comes to reactivity. I am okay with you picking your dog up if it is kind of a if it is a um, management option and something that you're doing to help your dog and you are taking them away from the trigger. So what I do not recommend doing or think is a good idea or think is fair to your dog is picking them up and still passing the scary dog in the same space in this close proximity. So if you are picking your dog up, helping them out, feeding them treats, getting them to calm down and also removing them from the trigger, I think that's totally fine. I also urge you to do some proactive training the other times when you're not in this, you know, in a perfect world, we would really be keeping our dogs under threshold during training. Of course they go over threshold and we are lucky that we can pick our dogs up and they're not gonna pull us down the sidewalk towards another dog, but it has to be picking them up and getting them relief and and saying, okay, I've got you, you're safe, here's some treats and we're running the other direction. We're We're, not going near that scary thing. Again, I don't want you to pick them up and bring them closer to the scary thing because that's really going to make their fear worse and probably cause them to react more next time. So I'm really glad. Thank you, Amy, for bringing that up because I think that's a big difference. And again, we don't want that to be kind of our first resort. We really want to be prioritizing training with these guys and helping them feel more comfortable in their world, not just always resorting to picking them up. Okay, so this is some training with a wonderful little dog named Trixie and with a wonderful family who um, rescued Trixie during the pandemic. And Trixie is super smart and she also unfortunately has some fears specifically towards her dad, which is a big bummer because they all live together. So Trixie's fear of her male owner, um, manifests itself in barking inside in the house. 
And her owner has done a really, really good job of trying to make himself as non-threatening as possible. He's not trying to, you know, force himself on her to make friends, anything like that, because that would make the situation much worse. So what we're doing here in this training session is we are working in a big, a more open space, which is much easier for dogs who are a little nervous. And we are um, working from a distance where she can just notice the male owner and not react. And what we're doing here is we are clicking the moment that Trixie notices. So we're saying, dad predicts good things for you. And then we're doing a little bit of waiting for Trixie to see the male owner and then look back at the female owner who's doing the training. And there we have a beautiful incompatible behavior to barking at dad to when she sees dad look back at mom. So you can go ahead and see how this looks. Going to be click the look. Good, you can click her for dropping it. Good, nice. Okay, all right, Mike, go ahead and get started. Okay. Here we go. Good, great. No, 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 that was great. That was perfect. Good. Good, good choice to click that look. Yes, all right, now you're gonna go ahead and wait for her to look back at you after looking at him. Lovely. Great job, Mike, you're doing great. Wait for her to look at him again. Beautiful. Mike, go ahead and keep going. Lovely. See her looking at him and looking back at you? Good. Yeah, you can cook that good. Oh, she said, I want to go say hi to dad. Good. Perfect. Wait till she looks. Yes. Very nice. So there we saw Trixie getting so comfortable. She's so under threshold that she slowly starts to move towards dad, which is great, right? And these two have really improved their relationship over time. They're still, you know, it can be really hard to undo fears if the scary thing is always there. So I would say dogs who are fearful of the people they live with is just one of the hardest things because nobody ever gets a break, which is really, really challenging. Um, but this training has really gone a long way. We always work at Trixie's, at Trixie's level. We, um, don't make things harder. We don't cause reactions intentionally or anything like that. We had a great question that asked, as they get better trained, do you still give them treats all the time? Great question. So definitely, definitely not. The goal when we're working on something as severe as reactivity or aggression, which we'll talk about in a second, is we have to be really, really heavy with the training. But as our dogs get better, we can absolutely back off on that amount of reinforcement and management and stuff like that, knowing though that we do want to always have some semblance of maintenance happening. You know, it, for a dog who has rooted fear or reactive behaviors or, or aggressive behaviors, those behaviors are always going to be in their brain. We're just hoping to give them replacement behaviors that are a little closer to the front of their brain for them to pick from. So unfortunately, they are always going to have that option of reactivity or aggression should the, should the um, circumstance align itself in a way that um, elicits a risk that response, the, the aggressive response or the reactive response. And so hopefully we'll get further and further away from that over time, but we don't want to take, we never want to, they're never, they're never quote unquote cured. Right. So we always kind of want to be ready to help them a little bit. So no, we absolutely are not going to have this level of training each time, but we want to always have the mindset of how can I help you? Maybe you'll always kind of plan just like we always grab the poop bags when we leave we always grab our keys we can always grab a few treats when we walk out the door to make sure we're there to help our dog or say great job with that you know that's really what i wanted i want to see more of that really nice job so great question thank you okay all right we're uh we're really at the at the tail the home run here guys you guys have been so awesome this is definitely one of my longer presentations, which I don't love doing to you, but lots of information, obviously. Okay, biting. Again, going back to that horrible, unnecessary nickname of ankle biters, small dogs definitely can display aggressive behaviors. And it is so important to remember, so aggression is basically a, an attempt to communicate, I need space, I am uncomfortable with your, what you're doing, and I, I would like you to go away. 
So aggression is typically a um, an attempt from your dog to communicate with you. And they often are giving tons of warning signals before that. And humans either don't know what to look for, so they don't know, they don't see it, or they're not listening, which again goes back to, oh, you know, you know, Fluffy, don't growl at me, you're fine. Or like, oh, you're gonna try to bite me. No, you know, I'm just gonna move you, pick you up, whatever. So this is when our dogs are like, no, really, I'm, I'm not kidding. I really need to get what I'm asking for, which is space. And so when these requests go ignored, all those warning signs, I'm uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable, they can absolutely go to a bite. So this is what's called the canine ladder of aggression. And it starts with very subtle stress signals of turning their head away, lip licking, yawning, um, blinking, blinking um, either more frequently or having more vigilance on the thing. There's there are a lot of really early signs that our dogs are not comfortable. They, then that goes to moving away, um, removing themselves, their tail is tucked, their ears are back. Um, and then they're cowering and they're again, retreating. And so they're slowly escalating in their communication of this is too much for me. To then we as humans, we are verbal communicators. So we're la la la, we're totally clueless to all these visual signals our dogs are giving us. And then finally they growl and we say, what the heck? What? Why are you growling? Well, and you know, that came out of nowhere. And they, meanwhile, they've been telling us for five minutes that they're uncomfortable with what's happening. And worst case, what we never ever want to do is punish the growl. We cannot punish our dogs for growling because our growl is a smoke detector. It is our dog saying, I don't want to bite, but I am uncomfortable and I'm trying to warn you. Now, I am not telling you to just go around and let your dog growl at you. But in that moment, you are not going to say, hey, you know, don't, you know, don't growl at me. You're going to say, OK, sorry, we're going to we're going to diffuse this situation. I'm going to think about what you were uncomfortable with that. And I'm going to see how I can proactively train this to help you more comfortable later. Because if we eliminate our smoke detector, we take that growl out of the equation. Our dog is going to go straight to a bite. And that is obviously what we don't want. So honor the growl. Listen to the growl and see how can I help you feel more comfortable with this moving forward. Okay, this is a big slide of dogs who very clearly, whether you can tell or not, who very clearly are saying, I need space. And they are trying to communicate, do not move forward. I don't like this, I am not comfortable. Now this, we'll start kind of on the left, this little chihuahua over here, ears back, furrowed brow. What I would recommend is maybe you take a picture of this slide and then go, I'm gonna have some resources for body language and go maybe study those resources and then come back to the slide and see if you can find the stress signals. So this ears back, his, his, his worried face, um, the chihuahua below him who's yawning. Yawning is a stress signal. Now, obviously, this guy on the left here with his teeth bared, that's a very clear signal. I'm not comfortable. I don't want you to come any, come forward. This fuzzy black guy on the left here, he is has his weight shifted back. He is showing a wide eye. His ears are back. And he is very timid about what's happening probably in front of him, which is perhaps somebody taking the picture. But this is a clear, oh, I'm not comfortable with this. I don't want to interact. This guy on the green turf right in the middle on the top, um, his head is low, he's got a furrowed brow, his weight is shifted back, and he has got his eyes directly on something. So he is very worried about whatever is happening right outside of frame. Obviously this guy down here with the in the middle with who's baring his teeth at the handling is doing a very clear, I'm very uncomfortable with this, ears are back, teeth are showing, furrowed brow. Um, my guess is, Maybe, you know, pictures are just a moment in time, so we have no idea what's going on, but perhaps this person is touching the dog in a way that they're uncomfortable and the dog is saying, do not move forward, please stop what you're doing. If you ignore this, the dog would likely go to a bite. Up on the right here, this little Pomeranian with his ears back, this is, he's showing what's called a whale eye, the golden dog in the harness. Um, and this is, again, a sign of being nervous because he doesn't want to turn his head too much. He's pretty stiff, but he wants to keep an eye on you. So he's showing the whites of his eye called a whale eye. Ears back again. This little guy down here in the, the little chihuahua with this, this pink necklace, this paw raise. This is an appeasing behavior. 
meaning I mean no harm. I mean, no, I am not a threat. Please stop what you're doing because I want to make sure you know that I'm nothing to worry about and whatever you're doing is worrying me. So please stop. You can also tell that his tail is, her tail is quite tucked underneath her. Her ears are back and she too has quite a worried look on her face. And then this guy all the way over on the right, tail up. This is a kind of a different display where he's making himself, there's a lot of arousal going on. He's making himself a little bit bigger, but he still looks quite uncomfortable to me. His ears are back. Um, his He's got his eyes directly on something. His tail is all the way up. This is called a flagged tail bending over his body. This is a sign of arousal. Lola, when her tail goes up, I know she's about to bark. So it's a, tails are really helpful indicators about how your dog is feeling. So wide ranges of communication here, but all saying the same thing, I am not comfortable. It is so critical that we understand, learn and understand canine body language. Oh no, here we go. Please hold. I'm just going to quit one of, oh, oh good. Wow, look at that, okay. All right, so real fast, when it comes to biting, behavior modification is basically centered around your dog becoming more comfortable with the situation that is causing them to bite. Are they scared of strangers? How can we help them feel more handle comfortable with grooming, handling, other dogs, resource guarding? That too is something getting them comfortable with taking stuff away. It requires a whole bunch of stuff. There's a big training plan that requires, that is necessary to change his behavior. And it is so critical that you work with a certified professional if your dog is showing aggression, biting, um, or even intense reactivity is worth to working with a professional. I mostly put this slide up so you know that, I mean, there's, there's just so much that goes into improving this behavior. So this is how you can help, great, you guys can still hear me, perfect, thank you. So this is how you can help your small dog. Give them choice. So let them approach things if they're scared. Let them move away if they're scared. Do not overpower them if you are struggle if they are struggling to avoid something. Help them when they're scared. Get them out of the situation. This is goes back to picking them up when they are reacting and nervous. You absolutely can pick them up to get them out of the situation. And learn canine body language and listen to what your dog is trying to tell you. So this is the, an incredible canine dog body language book by Lily Chin. I highly recommend this. It's super easy to understand. Um, it's, Lily does an incredible job drawing all sorts of different types of dogs. So I highly recommend this book. Um, and here are some, let me get out of that. If you wanna work with a trainer, virtual training is incredible right now. There are so many things we can help with virtually. And these are the organizations I want you to look for when you are seeking out a trainer. So instead of giving you the certifications to look for, I instead am giving you the organizations to look for. And this is, you can go to these websites and look for their kind of, um, uh, you know, directory of trainers. And also consider, especially if your dog's behavior is severe, work with a veterinary behaviorist. Our veterinary behaviorist here in DC, the Animal Behavior Wellness Center, changed Lola's life. She is doing so much better. She was put on anti-anxiety medication. Um, they helped us come up with stuff to help her firework the phobias and to help with stressful situations. So she's doing really incredible. And with the help of a virtual of a veterinary behaviorist and virtual training, you can uh, get a lot of improvement for your dog. Okay, so there was a question about jumping for little dogs, which I didn't cover, I'm sorry. I mean, I really, there's so much time. So, so there was so much to cover. So with jumping, really important that you manage the environment, keep your dog on leash, prevent them from jumping. And then two, think about what you want instead and make sure that you heavily reinforce that with tasty treats and with access and attention from the person. So try to avoid letting um, jump and get them at um, interaction and attention because that just reinforces the behavior. All right. Somebody asked, um, is whining the same thing as a man demand barking in terms of trying to express a need? Maybe I find a lot of dogs who are a little anxious are a little bit more vocal and whiny. So maybe if we can work their brain, get them a little bit more tired, then we can eliminate some of that 
whining if it's anxiety related. If it's trying to express a need, then that's a little bit different. Okay. Attention, how do you intervene? Sorry, just rolling through these questions. Um, okay, treats forever. So do you need to, I've talked about how long you're gonna need to use treats for kind of the frequency. Remember, we're gonna always wanna reinforce the good behavior, but uh, we're definitely gonna be able to decrease the frequency of that. If you're using a clicker in training, you do not have to use that forever. You can use your verbal marker if you want to. Technically, the clicker is mostly used for teaching new behaviors, um, but I do find it really helpful for reactivity work because it's such a crystal clear sound. So when you're first initially trying to break through that reaction or you need that split second moment when your dog is seeing a trigger but not yet reacting, and that's what we want to capture, the clicker can be really helpful. But I think absolutely you can work away from using and needing to always bring your clicker. The verbal marker is great. A yes. Um, is great because you can uh, still get the point across that your treats coming on the way, but they've learned, I believe studies showed that the clicker was slightly more effective. Um, okay, gonna roll to the next one. Small dog is not dog friendly, but I have a, lar a little large dog who used to be dog friendly, but now when the small dog starts barking, the larger one now starts barking too. So when one dog starts barking, the other dog starts barking. This is very normal and common, unfortunately. You could, they can absolutely learn from each other in good ways and bad ways. You're going to have to separate them, work on the training together. I mean, separately, and then work on the training together. That's going to be for any behavior issue. You have to work on them individually to get those skills individually and then bring them together so that both of them know what the deal is and what the training game is going to be, even when they're together. So. Um, a little dog who does a lot of puppy biting, play biting. So I think a lot of little dogs, when we do finally get down on the floor with them, it can be really exciting. So you want to make sure that you have a nice long rope toy that you can use for them, that they, they can be on one end and you can be on the other. I think it's great to be down on the ground with them and playing, especially because, again, we always exist above them. But if, it, if biting is a really big issue, again, nice long rope toy. If they get too out of control, if they're really young, um, it could be just that they've had enough of the play. They're too tired. If they're a little older, they could be overwhelmed with the play. And, and that's when you can transition to them to maybe a chew to go work on themselves and um, end the game there so they don't practice that biting. Can yawning be a sign of them not getting what they want? So this is a really good example of kind of anthropomorphizing something and labeling something like kind of assigning a human story to it when I really would recommend looking at just the behavior and then the context of the behavior. So yawning is a stress signal. So if a, do a dog is yawning, um, it can also be kind of a calming signal, meaning like, oh, I'm trying to diffuse this, the tension here. If a dog is yawning, there's typically going to be a reason. There's something that they are uncomfortable with. Um, it's not like the end end of the world. I mean, somebody made a joke once that like for chihuahuas, it just all it takes is like the wind to blow and they start throwing out stress signals because they are just naturally can be a little bit more nervous. And so they but that being said, like they are clearly reacting to something that they are perceiving as not pleasant or uncomfortable or weird. You know, sometimes dogs will just yawn when things are different or weird. So it's, if they are, if they want something in that moment and they're not getting it, they might find that uncomfortable. Um, tough to know without seeing, without seeing the specific situation. All right. We're going to go a little bit over. We're already four minutes over. Sorry, Deborah. Um, uh, oh, if my dog is being timid when meeting a new person, does it help to pick him up? So this is, I'm, I wish that we had gotten a chance to talk about this in the thing. I, if your dog is nervous about meeting someone, do not pick them up and then have the person greet them while you are holding them. Cause that goes through all the, that goes against all the choice and control that we talked about. Your dog has no way to say I'm uncomfortable. I want to remove myself because they're stuck in your arms. Now, if your dog's timid and you need to hold them and you can feed them treats while they look at the person from a distance, that's fine. But any interaction with a person, if your dog is nervous about it has to be on your dog's terms and picking them up is not on their terms by any means. They might not be reacting, but remember, fight, flight, or freeze, their fear doesn't magically go away because we're holding them. Uh, they are likely less comfortable, more uncomfortable, and and shutting down a bit. And that's where you can definitely get a bite. If somebody is reaching because your dog is quiet and they're reaching and your dog is stuck here and your dog is like, oh my God, oh my God, don't come closer, don't come closer. 
boom, get away from me, bite, which wouldn't be their fault at all. That'd be totally provoked. Okay. Um, this presentation has been incredibly eye-opening. However, I feel like such a terrible pet owner knowing that my dog is so afraid and anxious. Okay. I'm so sorry you feel that way. You didn't do anything wrong. I'm so glad you were here to learn. I can't afford to work with a professional. What can I do to still help? So this is a fantastic, I'm so glad you brought this up because unfortunately good professional training is expensive. You get what you pay for. And that is really uh, frustrating because if it's cheap and it's, if it's affordable, like there's a good chance that you might not be getting quality work. So I will tell you, please follow me on Instagram at JW Dog Training because I reshare. There's a beautiful positive reinforcement reactive dog community on Instagram, on social media. Now you have to make sure you're only following certified dog trainers because there's a lot of bad advice, bad, bad, bad advice out there as well. But it can be a really in, in beautiful um community of support and education and information. Now, that being said, uh, there are a lot of options out there, especially with virtual training now, like a, more of a group class or like more webinars or um, there's a lot of books that you can read. Uh, a great place to start, I would just go to the Your Dog's Friend website and look at the resources there between the webinars and the books and the different people offering virtual training, you might find something that is affordable to you. And um, definitely there's so much education out there that you can benefit from that is free. And feel also, okay, so my email didn't get into this. I wanna like write it down for you guys. Um, let me put it into the chat. Um, please email me. And if you have more questions, um, I just put it into the chat window because that will, I can, I'm happy to point you in the right direction because this is a, this is a delicate journey. Like you could go on the wrong journey and find horrible advice that will make your dog's life much worse, or you can find a beautiful world of wonderful advice. <sighs> okay. Jet, I'm from Holland and the Netherlands. Willems is my last name. Thank you for being here. Um, okay. All right. I think we only have a few more. Oh, we've got goes nuts when they sees rabbit or squirrel in the yard. Can't block every window. So honestly, I mean, you have to, um, if you can't be there to train. So this dog is barking out the window at squirrels. And if you can't be there to train, we have to find a visual block. Like there's just no other way around it. So think of, I mean, you'd be surprised like with window film, especially if a small dog's just like on a, the bottom half, bottom third of a window, you can actually get, uh, a lot accomplished um, by just doing a small part of the window. And if you don't want to commit to window film, just maybe putting up some paper for a few weeks, like taping it up and seeing if that helps. And then you're like, wow, this sure does prevent the barking. Um, or you can use gates, you can close doors to prevent access to the front part of the house or wherever the house part of the house is that the um, dog uh, can see out. But it, unless you are there to train 24 seven, the behavior will not improve because yeah, you might be able to train once a day, teach them click and treat for looking calmly, but then they, um, the, you know, you do that twice a day, but then the eight other times a day, they're barking at and getting really good at reacting to squirrels. So, uh, it's just a really tough scenario where management is so, so, so important. Okay. Um, Christina asks, you mentioned in my apartment complex to turn around when I see a dog and its owner. When we turn around, should I give my dog a treat? Totally, right? Because let's think about that equation. You're asking your dog to turn around with you. They do. That's a behavior we want to see more of. So let's reinforce it. That is the law of positive reinforcement of learning theory. Reinforce behavior you want to see more of. I recently worked with a client who had an amazing U-turn. She would whip around in a circle and the dog knew that she was going to toss a treat. And he was like, it was like, walk, walk, walk. And they like, they turned so fast. And so because she had reinforced that so many times, so the dog had the behavior really well, really strong under his belt. All right. I am going to really quickly look through the chat for, I think there are just a few more questions. Thank you guys for being here. We still have quite a few of you. Um, and I'm going to try to answer just the last questions here. Okay. Um, 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 um. Uh, do you have to brush their teeth if they haven't, um, lost their baby teeth? I don't think so, but ask their, ask your vet. 
because those teeth are going to fall out anyway. What you do want to do, though, is get them used to brushing their teeth. So I lied. Absolutely start brushing their teeth in a really slow, positive way, because if that's something you want to do for the rest of your life, practice it during their socialization period. <laughs> All right. We talked about when one dog starts barking, both dogs start barking. You have to address it with the one who starts barking. You got to get them under control, whether you're managing, giving more mental stimulation, um, using noise machines, you have to work on the dog who's barking to decrease the barking for both of them. Okay. Uh, <laughs> something strange happens around 7 or 8 p.m. When, where my four-month-old dog goes crazy. He has the zoomies and he just runs around and starts growling. This is called the witching hour. This is very normal. This is usually in puppyhood between eight weeks and like five months, but it can absolutely still exist in adolescence where our dogs just go crazy and just let them do it as long as they're not doing anything bad. They're not biting on you. Just like let them let it out because they're usually so overtired from the day that they get really um, over. They're just like cooked. They're done and they just go nuts and they zoom, zoom, zoom. They bite a few things. They go crazy and then they crash. So very normal. Uh, let it out. It, they'll grow out of it. Um, is there a way to stop barking when feeding? It's like, give me my food. Great question. Okay. So if you don't want the barking, what do you want instead? I would recommend practicing like a go to place, like a sit nicely on the kitchen mat or something. And if they're quiet, that's what gets them the food. Um, but it's challenging, but there's some things about like behavior chains. And if you, if you always, if it's like bark, bark, quiet, gets them the food, then they'll always bark, bark. And so that's where working with a trainer to help you work through that is really helpful. Hey, dogs getting really distracted when they go outside because they're so distracted they don't go to the bathroom. Very normal. You have to find a pretty low distraction spot and you have to stay outside until they go. And if they don't go, especially if it's a dog under like six months, if they don't go and you're worried about accidents, when they come back inside, you have to constrain them, um, re restrict access, confine them uh, to a crate or a pen so that they um, – don't have the opportunity to go again and then try again in like 10 or 20 minutes. Hmm. Your dog's friend has a great class called passing dogs on leash. Nicole, you shared the link. You give them. Ooh, what do you think of calming collars for dogs? Um, okay. So not kind of, sh not quite sure what common collars you mean. I love what's called the adaptal collar. So this is a pheromone collar that gives out calming pheromones. I absolutely do not recommend any um, prong collars, shock collars, any training collars necessarily. I really only love the adaptal collar for calming. Um, and I think it's great. Adaptal in general is great. Okay, I mentioned two books in this webinar. One is Kim Brophy's, uh, I believe it's called Learn Your Dog, but Kim, B-R-O-P-H-E-Y, and then Canine Enrichment for the Real World, which is a great, great, great book. All right, I'm almost done. Oh, Meet Your Dog. Thank you, Nicole. Great. Okay, okay. We're going, I think we're almost done. You guys are so awesome for waiting. Okay, I think... Oh, good. Yes, yeah, CPDT is fantastic. Um, okay, barking in the car, same thing, management, you have to restrict access. Put them in a crate and cover the crate. That's a big, really helpful change for that. Um, okay, what if the other owner, if there's a trigger out on a walk and your dog and you can't get away, so this is common where your dog is, um, you're stuck somewhere when the trigger is, then okay, this, if you're picking up your dog, you're shoving food in their face, right? Like, so we need to get them eating as quickly as possible because that's what's going to calm them down. They're having an emotional reaction, a huge emotional reaction. So we need to help get them to a better emotional state as quickly as we can with larger dogs. They usually do a treat scatter, just tossing treats on the ground, get them to start eating. Great question. But that's a bummer. I mean, that's the hardest part when, when you're stuck somewhere. <sighs> okay. Okay, I think... Um, adaptal, uh, great question. So somebody had the adaptal collar and didn't see a difference. I mean, it's, it's not going to be a night and day difference. If anything, it's just going to kind of take the edge off in a very broad way. You're likely are not going to see a huge difference, but my opinion is usually it can't hurt. And so if it's doing anything to help, great, especially if you're doing other interventions, it can be really hard to tell what is helping. Um, 
doesn't like being confined. Okay, so being in the car, your dog doesn't like being in the carrier, and he whines and barks for about 10 minutes. So if you can put the carrier, well, now that I mentioned safe driving, I don't know what they recommend, but if you can put the carrier maybe like on the floor in the front of this car so you can maybe feed treats for him, being quiet, give him a frozen Kong, so something that he can't choke on, but that he can try to um, eat while he's in there. Also, this is something car fear and car discomfort is something you really want to practice and work on when you're not actively having to drive somewhere so that you can just sit him in the car without turning it on, feed him, get him really comfortable with that and kind of go from there. Um, but obviously not super safe to work on while you're driving. So a lot of the work has to be done when you're not. Um, it's good for them to lick themselves or blanket or a toy. So licking can definitely be a self-soothing behavior. If it becomes obsessive, you'll want to talk to your vet about it. So sometimes dogs will lick their paws raw or they'll really lick a blanket a lot. Um, I, I don't think that's the end of the world, but if it's a big stress response and they're doing it constantly, that means they're pretty stressed a lot of the time. So we would love to give them some help with that. <sighs> okay. Do you have any tips for making small dogs comfortable in a multi-dog household with large dogs? So this is a great question. And this is where giving your dog a safe space, like a home base where they know if they run and retreat to the other dogs will not get to them. So like a smaller crate that ha that's mostly covered is really, really important. So giving them a break from the, the hubbub of the house is so helpful and encouraging them to be there is great. Really great question. Okay. 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 Counter surfing? Counter surfing? How, how, uh, how big is your, how bouncy is your small dog that they're counter surfing? That's like the one thing that we get a break from as small dogs owners is counter surfing. Um, if you have a counter, a dog who is managing to counter surf, a small dog who's managing to counter surf, uh, wow, bummer. Sorry. Like I said, that's like the one thing we get a break from. Um, Make sure you're using gates and restricting access to the kitchen areas where they might be able to get it. Uh, maybe you're talking about a lower table, like coffee table, which obviously is much more normal for them to reach a lot of management. Um, you can train an alternative behavior, make sure that they're lying on a mat. They know that that works out instead of jumping up. Don't let jumping up and grabbing something from the table ever work for them, or they'll try it a hundred more times. Um, cat stuff. That's a heavy one. I mean, like, that's just a lot that I don't think I can answer right now. But again, um, think about alternative behaviors and reinforcing those instead, creating an environment where they practice those behaviors. This was for a dog that chases cats. Yes, we want to prevent that, but we want to, again, teach an incompatible behavior. We do not want to punish. We don't, because that can cause stress around the cats too. No punishing, no yelling, no spray bottles, anything like that. Okay. All right, guys, I think that that's it. I'm going to cut us off before you leave me any more questions that I'm just dying to answer. Um, thank you so much for all being here and for dealing with my technical difficulties. I promise I'll have that. That happened last time too. So I promise next time I'll have that under control. Um, you guys are wonderful. And thank you again. My email, Juliana at jwdogtraining.com, jwdogtraining on Instagram. You can find me there and I would love to chat, point you in the right direction to help you. And I hope to see you guys at the next one. Bye. Thank you.